It was long believed that this island was covered from one end to the other, from John O'Groats to Land's End, by woodland. I once read that a red squirrel could get from Land's End to John O'Groats without touching the ground. Well, that's now been proved wrong. It's now thought that there were clearings in this woodland that were kept clear by the grazing animals. Yeah, so let's have a go. By about 8000 BC, the people who'd come into what is now Britain at the end of the Ice Age uh, were hunter-gatherers. Now, if you can see bits flying off, that's how they made their tools. It's called napping. So if you nap something, that's like tapping away at it. Eccleshall Woods specifically has such a rich heritage with um, all the evidence of different things that have happened in these woodlands throughout time. This week we've visited an ancient uh, cup and ring stone monument. So 10,000 years ago, Stone Age people came and they made these markings in this rock. They've studied that, come up with their own ideas of what they thought that might mean. What do you think? Uh, a bike. A bike? It looks like a bike, doesn't it? You can see all sorts of things in there when you look, can't you? What do you think? It looks like a shell. The other group were with my colleague who was doing fire lighting with them. You just put that just underneath, just here. Yeah, so. The problem is you need the sparks on the fluffiest, driest bits. Excellent work. Right, we've got to get some stuff on to keep it burning. For some children, um, they like being much more active and all the children like being up and away from their desks and they, you know, they just kind of They've got more freedom out here and it allows me time to get to know the children a bit more and talk to them in a more relaxed kind of setting. And I've got the right kind of sticks. Um, we had you some, some sparks. Some, yeah, some sparks. I was trying to make fire. Yeah, then we put the other one, then trying do that, then it might get, then you can see a little, a little sparks. Oh, look here. Oh, look, there's someone here who's been there for ages. They're using the woodland to perform in, but we're also finding stories from the woodland, trying to uh, find out who lived here, who lived in the woods, what they did here, um, and making drama out of those things. Is everyone ready? Yeah. So the, those are our Mesolithic ancestors who roamed these woodlands between about 8,000 and 3,000 BC. While they were hunter-gathering, a revolution was taking place in the Middle East people starting to keep animals like cows and sheep and goats. So there would be a lot of areas just like this here where the wild woods would have been felled, it would have been cut down for big clearings of pasture land where the animals could have come and grazed all of the grass. And in the woods there is a fort. What would those walls have been made from do you think? Stones? So they may have needed to quarry so there may be areas on this bank where they've quarried the bank, they've dug into the bank to find stones. So really try to imagine that, really think about how alive this place could have been. We recreated a, a hill fort in miniature on the ground using natural materials. I basically, you think I'm trying to make the middle. Them. Why don't you stick this hand. in the middle? I'm just going to... Oh, so the children had to think about what a hill fort would have contained for daily life. And what's the mossy area? It's, uh, we thought um, it could be cropped. I, I know you're going to have kind of a hook, like a sheltered area for your animals. Alongside that, they did some tool use. Um, a good stake now. I think it would have taken a long time to have built a whole fort. Yeah. Imagine, and this is how they did By the time the Saxons came, we've got our place names that tell us that woodland clearing was taking place. Ecclesall, all, is a nook of land. And Eccles is the Celtic word for a Christian church. So Ecclesall means that it's a Christian church tucked into a nook of land. So they cut it when it got to that then, and then it grows some more and grows some more. So every 15 years they cut some bits off and leave the tree for another 15 years, let some more bits grow. From the late 16th century onwards, it was managed as a coppice wood. So you get the multiple growth of coppice. When you cut it, it grows back in multiple poles. And the coppice wood is for a multitude of uses. Most importantly, locally, charcoal. 
And one of the best monuments in the woodland, of course, is the monument to George Yardley, the charcoal maker, or as they were called in those days, wood collier. He died in his cabin um, because the, he was burnt to death um, in his cabin. There's no record of George Yardley being buried. So he must have burnt for so long there was nothing to bury. That was his last place. It's a unique monument. There isn't another one like it in the country. George Yardley, wood collier, burnt to death in his cabin. We're going to make some charcoal on a mini scale whilst you're making your charcoal picks and puts today. You're doing, you're really... Oh. The local iron industry and the local lead smelting industry were based on the products of the woodland. Charcoal for iron making and white coal for lead smelting. And there are 300 charcoal hearths or pit steads that have survived in the woods, levelled areas where they built the charcoal stacks. And there are 150 Cupids, as they're called, or kilns, where they made this white coal. So it's a fantastic archaeological site. Oh. Keep going, keep going! Oh. I'm mixing up um, some seed things from the from the reeds over there to make a brown colour for the inside of the tree because I'm doing bark peelers because they would peel bits of bark off and un underneath the bark it would be this sort of colour. Nettles to um, make uh, loads of light green for trees. They absolutely love trying different things out, seeing whether something works getting mud and basically getting really dirty and muddy and the kids have absolutely loved it. Uh, in the other group we're doing about the drama and about how people might have reacted to the fire that happened in the in the woods. Oh, I miss George. It's such a shame that when you tell your stories and see if you agree you might have different opinions. Yeah? This gives them that chance to explore the world around them rather than just sitting in a classroom. And I think in history, I think it's, you know, it really puts where, what Sheffield did in history. It's great seeing the kids come in and when you're kind of doing your evaluation at the end and you'll say, what have you learned? And they'll all be piping up saying, I didn't know about this and I've learned this today. And they're really excited about it. And, and they generally go away with a really good feeling about the woods and, and, you know, want to come back. Until the end of the 18th century, all, all the fuel for the iron industry and the steel industry was charcoal. This is why Sheffield is the best wooded city in the country because they were useful for so long for the metal industries. And in 1927 uh, the City Council bought Ecclesall Woods from Earl Fitzwilliam and they've been a site for recreation and wildlife ever since. Sheffield beekeepers promote the uh, amateur welfare of bees in Sheffield. We run courses for beginners to learn the, the art of beekeeping. We have a Saturday club that's a regular kind of once a month. A lot of it is learning about cooperation, teamwork and how to be part of a community. It's quite a strong one this one. We've harvested um, nettles, raspberry and bramble just from the local area and had those as options for people to drink. People are really into you know, buying herbal teas and things now and we're trying to show you know, you can actually make this yourself. We deliver an education service which covers all parts of the curriculum but even if it is a recreational session the children are still getting to come and experience the woodlands. Through that, hopefully, they'll have a good experience and they'll learn to nurture and respect them and visit them more so in their own time. Today we're trying to make white coal, but we don't know how white coal was made. Somehow, wood was laid over this, this pit 
Um, and at the downslope side, we think there was a stone line flue which would have funneled hot air and smoke up into the pit. And over the course of several days, this would have dried out the wood and made it the right consistency for white coal. White coal was very basically super dried wood. We use uh, all the way around the, um, the centre, we use for, um, for, for performances. When they come and do their youth theatre sessions, we're out um, for an hour and a half every Thursday night and they are developing their outdoor skills, um, working with tools and, and building props. We run woodland craft courses from basket making to uh, pole lathe turning or bodging in the true sense of the word, spoon and spatula carving, a longbow making course, bronze smelting, carving courses, rustic furniture making, wood carving for kids courses, iron smelting and blade smithing. Most of the materials for the craft courses we, we harvest from the woods so it doesn't travel very far before it gets to be used. Ecclesall Woods now is an excellent example of an ancient wood that survived and it's a big recreational resource for the city. There isn't another city in the country where within 15 minutes of the city centre you've got a wood of nearly 300 acres. So it's a big positive resource for the city. I wrote a leaflet about the wood about 20 years ago and I said in that I'm not showing any roots through the wood because it's possible to go on a walk every week of the year and take a different route. <laughs>